And joining us on the line from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Joseph Nye from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Professor Nye, it's good of you to join us tonight. How are you? Nice to be with you. You know, your country and mine are in the midst of national elections right now, so you seem the ideal guest to give us some advice and some understanding about what you have learned about the nature of leadership. So let's start with some of what you have found to be the qualities or skills that the best leaders, particularly in politics, have. Well, there are several which are crucial. One is emotional intelligence, which is the ability to control your emotions and use them to reach out to others. But another is contextual intelligence, the ability to understand how you adapt your style and approach under different circumstances and different situations. What's important to realize that leaders uh, are, are changing all the time as they adapt to different contexts. Uh, Winston Churchill was not a great leader in January 1940 when the context changed when Hitler invaded France. Uh, in that context, Churchill was a great leader. So context makes a huge difference, and the leader's ability to understand that is important. Can you be good at making decisions and yet be a bad leader? Oh, sure, in the sense that uh, you can think of lots of leaders who are bad people and who make decisions that are suited to their uh, goals, but uh, uh, the goals are bad. I mean, Hitler, for the first uh, decade of his uh, career, was a, uh, an effective leader, uh, but a bad person. So if you are a good leader, does that automatically presume that you stand for good? Not necessarily. and It depends how you define good in this sense. We use the same word to mean two different things. One is, are you morally good? And the other is, are you good? Like we say, a knife is good if it cuts sharply. Uh, that's a good knife. But if it is cutting somebody's throat, uh, you'd say that's a bad knife. Well, you can probably guess where I'm going with this. Some people would say George W. Bush is a good leader. He won two elections after all. Uh, he has led his country into wars on several fronts. Uh, we may discover 20 years from now that those decisions were very good decisions to have made. Would you say he's a good leader? No, I think Bush has not been an effective leader using good in that sense. Um, he has uh, reduced the status of the United States around the world. Uh, he was good enough politically to get himself reelected, though very narrowly. And, uh, but in terms of what he's done with his presidency, I think he's, uh, he's done quite poorly with it. Bush says that his job as a leader is to be the decider. But if you decide decisively in the wrong direction, uh, you can be a decisively wrong leader. Well, isn't leadership, though, at some level, just basically being able to get everybody else to do what you want? Well, if you can persuade others to do what you want, that's fine. But you also have to be listening to others to have some idea of what they want. It's very rare that a person can just sort of say, here's something I dreamed up totally in my own head, and I'm going to persuade all of you to follow me. Usually, you have to be listening to others, have a sense of the context, have a sense of helping the group decide where it wants to go, and then help them to move in that direction. So it's more complicated than just sort of saying, here's my idea, now I'll sell it to everybody. Hmm. Let me get you to weigh in on the nature versus nurture argument. Are great leaders born or developed? I think uh, there's a bit of both, but I think it's more developed than born. There were some fascinating studies that were done with fraternal and identical twins. Identical twins, uh, of course, have the same genetic structure. Fraternal twins have half. And what uh, the scientists found who looked for this was that you could explain about uh, one-third of the leadership positions that people achieve through genetics and about two-thirds through basically how they develop. So if you want uh, two-thirds uh, nurture, one-third nature. Okay. How about the, the notion of different cultures prizing different aspects of leadership? To be a great leader in your country or mine suggests a certain set of principles and qualities, but I'm sure it's different in other cultures around the world. Can you give me a for instance? Well, cultures matter enormously. Uh, if you take Japan, which is also going through a leadership transition right now, uh, it's very rare for a Japanese leader to appeal over the head of the party to uh, use television effectively. Koizumi, uh, the prime minister two times ago, uh, was rare in that. But by and large, Japanese leaders tend to be relatively gray figures who, who work within a party bureaucracy 
and uh, or not somebody that we would call charismatic. Uh, I think for American or Canadian leaders, the ability to reach out and appeal to others in a broader sense is uh, an important part of the leadership skill. Now let me give you another metric. Bill Clinton often said that he could not be considered a great leader because he did not govern during great or you know tremendously consequential times. How regularly throughout history do we find great leaders happen because the times truly call for them? Very often. I mean what we see is that uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier about Churchill, uh, that greatness uh, was a thrust upon him. Churchill in January of 1940 was regarded as a watched, washed up backbench MP. Uh, but in the context of June 1940, uh, when the circumstances of the British people was dire, uh, Churchill became somebody who was often seen as one of the greatest leaders of the uh, 20th century. So if he had uh, died in February of 1940, he would not have gone down in history as a great leader. Hmm. Now, of course, the, the challenges that face the world in the 19th century, the 20th century, our century, now the 21st, are all different. Uh, have we seen, as you examine the international political landscape, are we seeing an emergence of the kind of leaders you would like to see who are rising to the particular challenges of this time in our history? Well, I think we are seeing a mix of leaders. I mean, there are some places where uh, we're stuck with old-fashioned, top-down, uh, you might call dictatorial leaders. Uh, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe is a good example. Uh, most of the uh, Arab states of the Middle East have leaders who tend to be top-down and dictatorial. But in today's uh, modern economies and societies which run with networks as much or more than hierarchies, you need a new type of leadership in which people aren't king of the mountain giving orders cascading down, but are at the center of a circle uh, drawing people to them. In that sense, they need to use their soft power of attracting people to them, not just their hard power of issuing commands. I think we're seeing increasingly in our societies uh, that new type of leadership. Give me a name. Who's, who's the best example you can see out there today who wields a kind of soft power that you just described? Well, I think Tony Blair was an example in England. Tony Blair was uh, very effective at drawing people to him. He, he essentially uh, rejuvenated the Labour Party, drew a broad set of people to him. He was, he was quite good in using uh, soft power. I think Barack Obama in the American uh, political setting is uh, very good at that. Now, whether that'll be sufficient to win the election is a different question, Sure, but that's certainly his style. You've mentioned Winston Churchill a few times. Do I infer from that that you think he's the greatest leader of our time? No, I think Churchill was a great leader, but again, for a particular set of purposes in time. Uh, remember, after Churchill became the key or the hero of Britain's resistance to Hitler and winning the war, the British people voted him out of office in mm -hmm. 1945 because at that point what they wanted was to develop a welfare state and they didn't feel that Churchill was the best person for that. Hmm. Obviously you can be a great leader in politics but you can also be a great leader in business or in the arts or in sports or in volunteerism. Do these leaders in these different areas of our society have common traits however? Well I think you find that leadership is very broadly distributed in democratic societies. Uh, it's not just the president or prime minister or the top uh, figures. Uh, it goes down to the local school committees, the local town councils, uh, local party organizers, and so forth. And I think the traits that they have to have is an ability to listen, to reach out to others, to in sense empower others, so that the old-fashioned view that we have of leadership as the, the dominant male who gives orders, I think that's giving way to uh, a broader, more network type of leader who uses more soft power, not just hard power. And I think that's true in, in uh, uh, many different settings. Obviously, it's, you can use a bit more hard power of command than control if you're a head of a business than you can if you're head of a university. But uh, I think we're seeing that even in businesses, the old uh, I'll give the orders and you'll follow is uh, not always sufficient. Well, there was a good uh, quote in your book about Jeff Immelt, the head of General Electric, who said, I need to make, you know, what is it, 12 or 13 dictatorial mm -hmm. decisions in my company. If I make 17 or 18, I lose everybody. If I only make two or three, the company goes down the drain. You've got to know where to find that balance, don't you? 
Well, that's exactly right. And that's why this point I make in the book about contextual intelligence is so important. Contextual intelligence is a little bit like a surfer. Uh, if you are waiting to ride a wave and you get on your board too soon, you're going to topple over. And uh, if you get on too late, you're going to miss the wave. That, that sense of timing, of understanding the context so that you can actually ride the wave to your objective is a, is a critical skill for leaders. Hmm. Who was the most disappointing leader in your lifetime, did not live up to expectations? Well, I think it, it, Richard Nixon had the capacity um, to be a great leader. He, what he failed at was emotional intelligence. Uh, he actually, on foreign policy and in some of his domestic policies on the environment, uh, was ahead of his time, but uh, he didn't have the emotional intelligence, that sense of self-control uh, to preserve him or protect him from the inner demons that eventually did him in. Hmm. I'm speaking to you tonight from the capital city of the province of Ontario, and we had a former premier of Ontario named David Peterson who once said, the people think you're a great leader if they agree with you, but if they don't, they think you're arrogant and out of touch. <laughs> Is he onto something there? Well, that's true. I mean, if, uh, if people are disagreeing with you, they're going to charge you with all sorts of things. But the extent to which a leader, even if he or she has to do things that are unpopular, is listening, uh, is reaching out, they can actually uh, avoid some of that. Uh, I remember a friend of mine once saying about Teddy Kennedy, this is a friend who is a staunch Republican, said, you know, Teddy Kennedy, I don't agree with his politics, but you know, he's not so bad. Whenever he comes to the Chamber of Commerce meeting, he throws his arm around me, he asks, how's Agnes and the children? <laughs> he said, you know, he's not that bad a guy. <laughs> so there is a lot to be said for that kind of touchy-feely, soft leadership kind of thing. Well, it works. It, it does, it, doesn't it? It softens the hard edges. <laughs> As you look at the, I'm not going to ask you to gauge our election scene because I suspect you're not as familiar with the five major party leaders here as, as our viewers are, but how about in the United States right now? We are fascinated with your election, uh, as are you. Barack Obama or John McCain, who exhibits, by your criteria, the better leadership skills at the moment? Well, they're very, uh, they're similar in one sense. They're both senators without extensive executive branch experience, and therefore we can't judge how they've run large organizations. But they're very different in terms of generation, very different in terms of where they've come from. McCain's a genuine national hero in terms of his war record. Obama, a man who has represented a widening of the American electorate, not just with his own background, but the way he's raised money in small donations on the internet and reached out to a younger generation. Two very, very different types of leaders, each uh, interesting, uh, each admirable in their own way. Uh, I should say I prefer Obama, but uh, I also admire McCain. I know they've both been criticized for a lack of executive uh, experience, and of course when you're in the Senate you don't have that kind of executive experience. But Obama countered that, you know, he is running a campaign that employs about 25,000 people. Uh, is that a decent argument for advancing the notion that I do have executive experience, I can decide, and I can lead, uh, and, and, and I have more executive experience, I think he goes on to say, than, for example, Sarah Palin, who's been governor for 20 months. Well, I think it is interesting to watch how a person runs their campaign. It's an extraordinary complex process, not just in the number of people, but the surprises, the, the ups and downs. And if you want to judge a leader's emotional intelligence, how do they deal with setbacks? How do they turn, if you want, lemons into lemonade? Uh, I think Obama's done very well on that. Uh, take the incident in which his pastor, Jeremiah Wright, uh, got him into trouble by uh, saying a number of things which sounded racist uh, to many uh, white Americans. Obama used that uh, as a way to give a speech, which is one of the best speeches on race that we've heard since the days of Martin Luther King. So that ability to, to ride with setbacks, to overcome them, to turn them to advantage, uh, that experience in a campaign is impressive. Similarly, in McCain, a year ago, many people thought he was finished. Uh, it was interesting that in the summer of 07, uh, McCain was written off, and yet he was able to remount his campaign to uh, win in, in New Hampshire, and now the race is very close to being tied. Indeed. Still can't give a speech to save his life, though, can he? 
He's not the orator that, uh, that uh, Obama is, mm -hmm. uh, but he's, uh, he's nonetheless effective, particularly with small groups in town meeting type settings. Yes. Uh, we urge people to consult The Powers to Lead, which is your book on this issue of leadership. And Joseph Nye, we thank you for coming on TVO tonight to talk to us about it. It's my pleasure.